yeah, in, in our current context, uh, we can maybe just say that governments have the official responsibility to prevent and respond with adequate policies to keep their populace, population safe, while science plays a decisive role in informing these policies. Unfortunately, there can be quite, uh, quite some controversy between researchers. And uh, in this case, like, how do we deal with uncertainty and, and scientific um, yeah, war to truth? Um, especially when decisions need to need to be taken. So uh, yeah, how can we minimize not only potential death, but also heavy impacts on our lives, our freedoms, and also the general socio-economical health in a pandemic context? Um, Adriano Manino made us the great pleasure to share today a pint of reflections uh, on these questions. He's a philosopher, a writer, a policy consultant, and a serial entrepreneur. Um, he has been researching on issues at the intersection of science, ethics, and public policy, which includes also disaster preparedness, uh, big data, artificial intelligence, climate change, and even animal sentience. He is currently working at the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich, and he co-founded the Solon Center for Policy Innovation, as well as one company on data space and three nonprofit organizations. He also published two books related to the pandemic, one being a best-selling book, um, which title uh, is COVID-19, Was in der Krise selbst, so what, does, what matters in the, in, in the crisis. Um, and a more recent one on ethical issues of triage of medical patients. Uh, these books contain obviously much more information than what we can uh, cover in one hour session, um, but you'll be invited, invited to consult them, of course. Uh, Adriano, I would like to thank you again for uh, being, us, uh, yeah, being with us uh, today. Uh, and to all participants, uh, please do feel free to write your questions in the chat for the post presentation discussion. Uh, you will be also um, directly invited to ask your questions to Adriano uh, later uh, directly, if you prefer. So yeah, without further ado, fur further ado uh, Adriano, I invite you to take over the microphone and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, and um, everyone on the uh, organizational team. Um, that's a really awesome and important event, I believe. So thank you so much for doing this and um, for inviting me. So as Sarah said, my uh, topic is the following question. How can science help us in a pandemic? I mean, that's a huge question, needless to say. And um, so for the purposes of this talk, this short talk and discussion, I tried to break it down into two example questions. Of course, I could have focused on many, but um, those are the two that, that I chose. Um, so the first question that I'll address um, will be how science can inform public policy um, when actually it doesn't speak with a unified voice. Then, you know, what does it even mean to say that science says X or science recommends X? When, you know, in fact, science, of course, ultimately is just the collective of practicing scientists, and they may disagree. In fact, they almost always disagree, but sometimes they disagree very sharply. So, um, yeah, it seems like particularly in uh, situations of crisis that have a natural origin. Now, in terms of the present crisis, of course, the origin is microbiological then yeah, what should we rely on if not on science? But then if we realize that in, as far as some questions at least are concerned um, at some points in time, say during a pandemic, there's like um, a large amount of disagreement among scientists too. And that gives rise to the question of, well, how can we rely as a, as a society, as individuals, as policymakers, how can we rely on science in the face of scientific disagreement? And the second question that um, I will address uh, is the one of vaccine 
um, research and development. And basically whether there would have been ways to unleash, I mean, that's been a huge feat, of course, uh, in terms of vaccine um, development and, and research and development that we've seen. But the question I'd like to speak to is whether we could have unleashed um, the potential of science for social impact on this front um, much more strongly. So specifically, could we have been vaccinated by autumn 2020? And I'll make a case that um, there's a good chance that we could have been actually, and that it's uh, very tragic accordingly that we failed to implement the policies that would have enabled us to, to be much more successful in terms of pandemic management. And um, so, yeah, as Sarah said, as, and, and as you can gather from uh, the questions that, that I will be addressing, um, this is not a scientific talk, actually. I myself am not a scientist. I'm a philosopher with um, yeah, a long-standing interest in, in science and technology. I believe you can't really do proper philosophy without taking a keen interest in, in science, technology, um, social development, of course. And uh, I believe in the continuity of philosophy and science, actually, as a, as a matter of historical fact, of course, the scientific disciplines grew. Um, out of philosophy, and I do believe, as I said, in, in that continuity. So it's going to be a talk actually in the philosophy of science and the ethics of science. And I do want to argue that those disciplines or basically what we believe about them. And, you know, even if we're not philosophers or ethicists of science, um, as you'll see, um, we at least implicitly do have lots of beliefs, you know, about the philosophy of science, the ethics of scientific practice. And uh, those beliefs will influence very strongly. Um, that's what I'm going to argue. They do influence very strongly the social impact that science will have, particularly in times of crisis. And so we are well advised as a society to debate those questions um, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Adriano, just before we move to the next slide, can you uh, maybe try to put the slides in the presentation mode? Yeah, I tried, but unfortunately, it's not uh working. So okay, I no problem then. Had to, I had to exit it. Yeah, I'm sorry. No problem. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as for the first question, um, which concerns relying on science when scientists disagree. So for instance, um, to take an example, in early 2020, there was a lot of disagreement actually among scientists about how seriously we should take the COVID-19 threat, you know, with many comparing it to the flu and saying, that, you know, even in past epidemic or pandemic outbreaks, um, many of them didn't turn out to be that serious and were overestimated and so on. And with really many also sort of scientific state agencies, uh, the RKI, for instance, in Germany, really comparing the threat to the flu, essentially, in terms of the, the level of risk and trying to calm down um, all of society and not trying to put us in a mood of, of, of real kind of attentive preparedness. Now, um, there were, of course, some scientists who said that we should be gravely concerned, especially, you know, on a global level. So it was very striking to see that scientists in Eastern Asian countries, for instance, took a very, very different line from the very same. That's, I think, due to a, a number of causes that we could go into. But that was striking, you know, sort of widening our perspective globally. Um, it was obvious that there was large disagreement in the global scientific community because many experts from Eastern Asia in particular um, were advising their gover governments and global society to take this threat extremely seriously indeed. And so that gives rise to the question, you know, what should we do as policymakers, for instance, um, when we realize that scientists disagree pretty sharply? So one idea, of course, would be to just poll scientists and then follow the majority opinion. But that's faced with a common objection, not least from, from many scientists who will say, including in public, well, but you know, that's, um, that would be mistaking science for democracy. Science is not democracy. You know? So that's the, that's the usual objection to this kind of thinking. Now, what to make of that? So I do think it contains an, an important grain of truth, namely that reality or the truth about reality is certainly not determined by anyone's opinion, um, majoritarian or otherwise. So I do think that's the, the grain of truth in, in, in that objection. But um, I would like to argue that it's largely false or that it does at least come with a grave danger because it turns out, so if you do some philosophy of science or epistemology, 
turns out that applying democratic or kind of democratic um, seeming principles to scientific opinions to the belief of science beliefs of scientists is actually among the best things we can do in attempting to get at the truth. So of course we must not mistake anyone's opinions, including scientific majority opinion for reality or for the truth. But it does turn out, so if you reflect on that philosophically, that actually maybe taking or listening to um, the majoritarian opinion of scientists at, at any uh, given point in time, is maybe the best we've got in terms of trying to get at the truth, particularly when we ourselves are not experts, but maybe even when we are experts. So imagine that you're an expert within some scientific discipline and you realize that, oh, wow, there's like hundreds or even thousands of colleagues that disagree with me. So this should probably give you pause, you know, because maybe you are in the wrong. It's not clear who's in the wrong, particularly if you have colleagues that are your epistemic peers that are equally well published, maybe in a field and so on. Um, then that should give you pause as well, even if you are among the class of the experts too. And actually that can be modeled mathematically, formally, so in formal epistemology and formal philosophy of science uh, at the University of, um, of Munich, for instance, uh, where I do research, there is a center for mathematical philosophy. And um, so there is a theorem or a family of theorems that go back to the Marquis de Condorcet, who was a, an important figure uh, during the French Revolution, a moderate progressive who was killed um, by, by the Jacobins, a mathematician and political philosopher who devised um, democratic voting systems. Maybe you've heard of Condorcet voting. And he was also kind of the father of, um, um, of those jury theorems. And of course, I could go into the formal details here, but just extremely roughly and intuitively, those theorems tend to say the following. So in a group of people, if you have a group of people tasked with forming beliefs, judging maybe difficult matters, then the following sort of theorem holds. So if those people judge um, um, the matters independently, that's the first condition. And if they do better than chance, even just slightly better than chance. So let's say, you know, you have people who try to, uh, to do weather forecasts or what have you, um, those could also be like people on a jury, um, so in the judicial system, and they try to judge a matter, say whether somebody is guilty or not, and they are only slightly better than chance. So let's say, you know, each of them have like a 51% um, probability to be able to get at the truth um, in a given matter. Then the theorem says that as you increase the number of people on the jury, say the number of reasoners, um, the probability of the majority opinion being correct actually approaches 100%. So um, if, uh, if you'd like to try this out mathematically, the proof is relatively easy. Of course, you know, then you can complicate it when you start to reflect more deeply uh, about those theorems, but it's mathematically, it's pretty easy to see. And, um, but yeah, maybe a surprising result, you know, but that's often informally, of course, also referred to as the wisdom of crowds. And so, yes, there is, informational epistemic wisdom in democracy, it seems also. So, you know, if you, you can apply that, as I already mentioned, to, to juries in the judicial system, maybe it's also an argument for democracy. So if you assume that the average voter say, I mean, of course, you know, voters are not totally independent of one another. Many are just party followers and so on, but it's still like, it's a collective of agents, of reasoners. And if they have some degree of independence and that if they are even just slightly on average better than chance, then democracy, actually democracy's majoritarian opinion has a pretty good chance, you know, actually under suitable mathematical conditions an extremely high chance of, at least over time, um, getting at what's correct. Um, of course, there are various problems, particularly in practice, but it's a nice theoretical result and explains why you know, this objection that science isn't democracy is, is quite misguided, actually. Um, so yes, this kind of formal background can serve to explain why uh, listening to scientists' majority opinions pays off, you know, unless there is reason to think that they are extremely biased or actually maybe due to biases even worse than chance or super dependent upon one another. That may be true sometimes, but you know, by and large, it seems like uh, so, if you, so if you compare the scientific method and scientific practice uh, with other ways of forming beliefs, then it seems like, you know, that's like a huge, 
human achievement, just the whole practice of science where you get criticized. And of course there are biases of, of, of all kinds, but it seems like maybe it's a less bad way, you know, of trying to get at the truth than anything else we have devised so far as, as, as human beings. And um, so, yeah, one problem, of course, in the context of the pandemic was that, so if you take that seriously, you know, if you try to figure out what's true by consulting the scientific opinion, you know, sort of democratically, then what's crucial is that you consult the global community of scientists. And often there was there's kind of some kind of weird nationalism where, you know, in Germany, the experts that were consulted were largely German, you know, but uh, it's not like they have better expertise uh, just because they, you know, happen to be based in, in our country here. It's not like they have superior expertise to contribute than experts elsewhere. In fact, they may have had inferior expertise to contribute. As I said, so the uh, Eastern Asian experts tended to be completely right about the threat of the pandemic right from its start. And that may have something to do with the fact of them having experience or ex experienced the um, the first SARS epidemic in 2003 and so on, and then being better prepared as a scientific community locally, their governments in Eastern Asia also being better prepared and so on. And so actually this was a case where it, it would have been extra important, you know, to uh, listen to the whole community, the global community um, of scientists, but, you know, even if kind of expertise had been uniformly distributed, so I do believe that in Eastern Asia they, they were more competent, but even if that had not been the case, of course, it would have been super important to kind of aggregate, consult the whole scientific community, and then try to, to listen to, um, yeah, possible majoritarian opinions emerging there. Um, but now we can take this further and ask, uh, you know, should we stop there and just go with this kind of heuristic of following um, majority opinion? Actually, I would argue that for ethical reasons, it can be extremely important to sometimes follow the minority opinion because we're not playing a game of um, trying to maximize the probability that we're right, but particularly in contexts of potential disasters, the primary game that maybe we should be playing is trying to avoid the catastrophe. And so it can, it can pay off really to follow some kind of hedging principle, precautionary principle, some kind of risk hedging that would say among other things, something like the following. So suppose there is a, let's say a one to 10% chance that some catastrophe will strike. And so like accordingly, a, a greater than 90% chance that it will actually not strike, you know, that it's not a serious threat. And let's also suppose that, you know, countermeasures or precautionary measures could be taken um, against that threat. And suppose that they are sufficiently cheap in relation to the stakes of the catastrophe. So the expected damage that the catastrophe would cause. And then it seems extremely reasonable and actually even sort of ethically required to uh, take those measures, it seems, uh, those precautionary measures. But now you can kind of transfer that to the situation of scientific disagreement. And let's say, you know, out of the whole global community of scientists, you only get like 10% of scientists, scientific experts warning against a certain catastrophe and maybe 90% believing that it's not that serious. Well, then, and now in terms of like formal epistemology, that's like a complicated matter that I cannot go into, but maybe what wouldn't be the worst heuristic in this case is to say that, you know, then maybe if you're not an expert, uh, you should be, but even if you are an expert and are among the 90% here, maybe it should give you pause that 10% of your competent colleagues believe that there's a serious threat here, you know? And so maybe it, it, it would be reasonable to assign a probability of like roughly 10% that this 10% minority is actually correct. And that there is a 10% chance that a catastrophe will strike. And then if we combine that with the hedging principle that I just introduced, what follows as a conclusion that we should, is that we should immediately go for these uh, precautionary measures if we haven't already done so. And if we had acted in, according, um, in accordance with that kind of principle, I think that could have helped us a lot because um, as, as, as we now see, some countries, particularly countries, states in, in Eastern Asia, again, you know, um, were able to, to navigate that pandemic much more successfully than countries in, uh, in the Western world. So they had almost no deaths and uh, long COVID cases now, I, I suppose. 
And in many of those countries, no really hard lockdown measures were needed or basically none at all because they were really well prepared. They had a scientific community and state institutions that were well prepared. And so it would have paid off a lot, you know, to listen to them and maybe also learn, learn from their experiences, uh, their mistakes also that they did uh, some 20 years ago in the first SARS uh, epidemic outbreak. Because you only, if you only learn from your experience, from your own mistakes, then you're not going to learn that much, actually. So um, in, in, a, in a sense, that's just common sense. But you can also base it on you know, some formal epistemology and, and risk ethics. And so overall, there's a really strong case to, to follow uh, such principles. And, and I think we could have navigated the pandemic um, much better if we had done so. OK, that's for the, for the first question, essentially, how can we rely um, on science when scientists disagree. I think there's still a lot we can do, maybe surprisingly, even if there are huge disagreements in, in science. And as I said, that can go as far as it being reasonable to listen to a 10% scientific minority if that's the minority that says, hey, maybe there's a serious threat of catastrophe here. And um, then, you know, now I uh, applied this to the current pandemic context, but we could talk about other potential catastrophes. You know, if you talk to AI experts, uh, there will be a sizable fraction, maybe not even a minority, maybe even a, major a majority that says that there are catastrophic threats, uh, catastrophic risks looming in that space from advanced AI um, that uh, is, is being developed. Um, maybe it's likely that super intelligent um, AI will be developed by the end of the century. And so, yes, like a very serious fraction of scientists are saying that this comes with catastrophic risks, maybe also with huge opportunities. And uh, yeah, I do hope that in the wake of the pandemic, you know, such arguments that, okay, you know, we don't really know what's going to happen, but you know, the probability doesn't need, if it's about preventing a potential huge disaster, the probability doesn't really need to be high at all, you know, in order for there to be a strong argument to take it seriously and go for precautionary measures um, in the space of public policy. But now for question number two, could we have developed the vaccines much faster? And if so, of course, that's a catastrophe in its own right, you know, because now we've had to wait, to wait for the vaccines and the rollout and so on. And that's a huge additional damage, of course, you know, that that caused the fact that we didn't have them earlier, um, public health wise, but also, also in terms of, um, yeah, just socioeconomic, psychological, cultural damage and so on, uh, particularly also affecting um, younger generations so that's a crucial question, I believe. Um, would there have been ways to unleash um, the potential of science for social impact even more strongly? Um, I think there's a pretty crazy fact if you look into this about the whole pandemic that, um, yeah, I would venture to bet that future generations might indeed find particularly crazy, namely that the blueprint for uh, the Moderna vac vaccine in particular, uh, which is of course based on mRNA technology, has actually existed since January 2020. So in January 2020, from then on, we did actually have the vaccine. And uh, that, of course, gives rise to the question, well, but then why did vaccine production take so long? And the answer also is pretty straightforward, of course, as, 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 as you will know, the standard multi-phase procedures to test candidate vaccines and similar things for efficacy, but also safety, just take a really long time. And that's because direct human experimentation tends to be prohibited in, in most jurisdictions. Um, so what would direct human experimentation mean in that context? Um, it would mean performing so-called human challenge trials. And uh, in those trials, um, human subjects are vaccinated. And of course, you also have a, a control group that will receive um, a placebo and are then sort of deliberately infected with a pathogen, say with the novel coronavirus. And actually, you know, um, just in terms of scientific efficiency, scientific results, statistical ease, and, and just speed of the whole thing, that would clearly be scientists' preferred method. But of course, scientists too, as we all do, share um, ethical concerns. I mean, it's clear that 
such experiments can be highly ethically problematic. And um, therefore, you know, it's a phenomenon that you often get also in the history of sciences, particularly in the history of biomedicine, is just scientific self experimentation. You know, if you have like particularly young scientists who may not be at, at the risk that's super high from certain pathogens, just decide to go for some self experimentation. And the same happened actually from early 2020 on at MIT and Harvard, for instance, and, and other universities, you got like groups of young scientists infecting themselves and, uh, and conducting um, studies on themselves actually. But so the general question here that we should have asked extremely urgently and with great priority of course is, well, would there be ethically acceptable designs for human challenge trials? Because if so, it would have been extremely important to implement them right away, basically from January 2020 onward. And I want to argue that the answer to that question is actually yes. Uh, by going through um, like a standard dialectic, like objections and replies, and uh, then coming to that, that conclusion that yes, probably there would have been ethically acceptable, um, ethically acceptable designs. So um, as I alluded to, the general objection here is that, um, well, you know, ethically speaking, that just seems unacceptable prima facie because you're instrumentalizing other human beings. You're using them as mere means to an end uh, and the placebo group in particular, you know, they're not even receiving a real vaccine that may work and may protect them against the pathogen. And um, yeah, you know, how could the individuals in that group reasonably consent? You know, that just seems impossible and pose uh, a great ethical challenge. Now, I think like an obvious straightforward reply to this is that, well, I mean, you could conduct those experiments with voluntary human subjects only. And you could actually also compensate them financially such that you know it would plausibly be a good deal for them uh, if they evaluated the risks uh, to them in terms of the yeah, probability of harm um, and then weigh that against the compensation they get and so on and if they consent voluntarily if they give their informed consent um, couldn't we circumvent that first objection um, but then there could be a rejoinder, another objection that would say, okay, but if we went for that sort of design, that would really lead to an unjust exploitation of, um, of poverty and socioeconomic inequality. Because, I mean, yeah, it's clear, like, you know, if you're going to compensate people for participation in human challenge trials, of course, that's going to work as an incentive, particularly for people in financial need. So if you're um, maybe among the unfortunate socioeconomic class and suffering quite a bit on that front already, then you're going to be particularly incentivized to participate here, to put yourself, your health in danger in order to get that monetary compensation. And that just seems particularly unfair and unethical. And by analogy, you know, it could be argued that another thing, of course, that is also prohibited on similar grounds is like Oregon markets, you know. So, of course, there's black markets, but we recognize them unanimously as problematic. I mean, there would be a lot of supply and demand for kidneys, say. There is, actually. And so people, you know, um, would be engaging in such transactions on organ markets voluntarily. But still, there is a wide consensus that that's ethically problematic and should be prohibited. And so that kind of analogy could be drawn in order to argue that, uh, yeah, we probably cannot allow um, human challenge trials either. But then to this, I believe there are two pretty decisive, I guess, I mean, it's a longer story, of course, you know, we could, uh, we could do a whole applied ethics seminar about that, but that's a rough dialectic. And um, I'll just give you my personal opinion here based on the replies that I happen to find most convincing. Um, looking forward to, to the discussion, of course, and to your uh, potential criticism. So a first reply would be that, so if that's the problem, so if the exploitation of poverty and socioeconomic inequality is the problem, if that's the real problem, you know, then we could just have ethics committees that exclude the poor from participation, you know, then, you know, if only the rich can participate or the sufficiently rich, then you exclude that kind of problem. But could that really be the solution? You know, wouldn't that amount to a form of cynical paternalism where you're kind of, you're allowing the already rich to earn money by participating in these studies, 
but uh, you're prohibiting uh, the poor to do the same. You know, even it, even though the poor might, some of the poor might uh, also give their informed consent to these procedures and might be interested in doing that and might actually need the money um, much more than the rich people that you're allowing to participate. So um, that would be kind of a, um, a strange view, I think. And maybe even more importantly, um, referring to that analogy of, of, uh, of Oregon markets. So even though organ markets are prohibited, what's clearly allowed, like ethically and also legally, is altruistically motivated organ donation. So I'm totally free to donate a kidney to any stranger I like, you know? I'm totally free and actually that's, that's my right. So it's, 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 it's people's individual rights. So if, if you suffer from kidney damage and need an organ, it's, it's, it's perfectly within your right to attempt to get um, a, a kidney from an altruistic donor. And also on the part of altruistic donors, it's thought of and very correctly so, I think, uh, um, as an individual right of those people to, to engage in altruistic uh, organ donation if they so wish. And um, that, I think, suggests the conclusion that at the very least, so, you know, there's an analogy in here, I think, that's straightforward. So um, by participating in a human challenge trial for altruistic reasons, so with no compensation uh, of any monetary sort, I'm kind of making a donation, a donation of data, of knowledge to humanity in order to be able to combat that pandemic catastrophe in a much more efficient way. And I'm willing to incur some costs. And the, where the very same happens if I donate a kidney for altruistic reasons, for instance. And so it's completely unclear why one should be allowed and the other prohibited. And so I think the conclusion should be that at the very least, uncompensated participation in human challenge trials um, should be legal. Now, um, yeah, we couldn't get into the uh, specifics of that. So sometimes now you get like applied objections saying, but well, if you don't compensate people, you just won't get enough statistical power because not enough people will participate. Well, actually those objections are really implausible because in aggregate, so, you know, if, if, if you run the numbers like rough estimates uh, and those can be done in an evidence-based way, there is some evidence about how many people might be willing to participate in these studies. And if you then aggregate this kind of data globally, it seems like the, the statistical power will easily be great enough, you know, for there to be significant results that would greatly speed up um, vaccine development. But even if that were not so, you know, like, if, you know, if the uh, statistical power will be sufficient and so on, that's not like for the state to decide. It's, it's individual rights that are concerned, I believe. It's an indivi a scientist's individual right to conduct a human challenge trial with participants that all participate voluntarily and for altruistic motives. And it's also my right, I believe, to participate in those if I so wish. And it's not for the state to decide whether that makes sense in terms of like statistics and scientific procedure. That's just not for uh, the legal order to decide, I believe. But also I would say empirically, even though I do not have time to go into those details, that those practical objections too could be, um, could be surmounted. Now to conclude, if we roughly follow these kinds of arguments that I've sketched, then I think it's hard to escape the, the conclusion that the prohibition of human challenge trials um, on COVID-19 that we've seen throughout 2020, now it's been relaxed in some countries, so like in early 2021, some human challenge trials, uh, compensated ones actually, uh, have been conducted in the UK and elsewhere. But uh, yeah, in countries like Germany, for instance, they really remain um, illegal. And if the arguments that I have sketched are sound and on the right track, then I do believe that this is actually a very serious injustice, particularly towards us young people, because um, yeah, we were not particularly threatened from the virus but still had to shoulder like a huge burden, including now there's still kind of burdens from lockdown type measures. There's the burden that young people now have to shoulder that they will, uh, that they are last in line in terms of the vaccines and so on. And um, so, yes, I think it's a, it's, it's a serious injustice towards young people and also towards scientists who maybe would have otherwise uh, performed those uh, human challenge trials. And in addition, of course, um, to being an injustice, it's also a very likely catastrophe just in terms of the consequences, because there's at least a decent chance that with human challenge trials, we would have been able to 
greatly speed up uh, vaccine development. And there would have been a chance to go into the second wave uh, starting in autumn 2020 um, with a, a lar pretty large fraction of the population vaccinated already. And the general lesson I think that we can perhaps take away is that science is social impact. And I think that should be, you know, other than science just being awesome, that should be a great motivation for engaging in science and particularly in scientific projects that are of societal relevance. It's social impact really doesn't just depend on itself, but it greatly depends on philosophical and ethical presuppositions or society's beliefs about those, political beliefs about those, legal regulations that are influenced by those beliefs. And therefore we really also urgently, you know, next to just trying to get more of the science, particularly in times of crisis, ideally before crisis strike, more of the science into society and into policymaking, we also really need to debate those philosoph philosophical and, and ethical presuppositions relating among other things, and those were my two examples, to how we can rely on science when the science is itself uncertain, when scientists disagree, and also how we can address legitimate, very legitimate um, ethical objections to ethically crucial science. And often there is ways as I argued for the case of human challenge trials to accommodate those ethical worries and then still perform those experiments which are really important precisely for ethical reasons. And on that, I'd like to wrap it up and thank you so much for your um, attention and your time today. Looking forward to the questions. <laughs>